All right, so the question that I was going to ask this morning and can ask to those of you who, who was aware of that, was you planning on eating dessert at 9.45 in the morning? <laughs> Kaylin's ready to eat dessert anytime. <laughs> If, if, the, if the opportunity arises, he's going to jump on it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to try to speak this morning with the help of the Lord. Uh, the devil didn't make you do it. We've all heard the saying, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. Uh, there's a story of a, a lady who came home, and her husband was a pastor. And uh, she came walking in the door, and she had under her arm a package from Saks Fifth Avenue. Anybody know what Saks Fifth Avenue is? Hey, we got one, two, <laughs> got a couple of you. I shouldn't know what Saks Fifth Avenue is, should I? It's a, it's a women's dress store and a very high end. Uh, if you have any of those dresses, <laughs> you paid a lot for them, unless you got them at Goodwill. <laughs> Maybe you found them at Goodwill. But it's a very high end. So she walks in the, in the house with a Saks Fifth Avenue box under her arm. And the husband looked at her and he said, I feel really bad for you women. And she's like, what do you mean? He said, well, you are so harassed by the devil. And she's like, what do you mean? Well, this is the second dress that you have bought this week. And I know your excuse is going to be, the devil made me do it. And I just don't understand why he harasses you guys so much more than he does me. She said, well, yes, obviously the devil made me do it. He said, well, would you explain? She said, well, you see, it was like this. I was walking down the road, minding my own business, having a good day, just out for a stroll, when I heard somebody coming up behind me. And I knew it was the devil by his footsteps. I knew it was him, so I didn't turn around and look. But he come right up beside me, and he began to whisper in my ear just about the time we got in front of Saks Fifth Avenue. And he said, look at that dress in the window. She said, I ain't buying it, devil. Oh, it's beautiful. It's flowery and it's just like, just like you like. Has all the nice colors and everything. Just perfect for you. She said, I'm not buying it, devil. I already bought one this week. He goes, but it just would look so good on you. Just, you know what? It doesn't cost anything to try it on. Nothing. It's free. You can try it on. And look, it is your size. And it's on sale. Well, sale at... Saks Fifth Avenue is still really expensive. But she's like, I can go in and try it on. So she's telling her husband, she said, well, I went in the door and I was really nervous about trying it on because, you know, one step leads to another. <laughs> and, but she said, the devil just pushed me and pushed me and pushed me till I was over standing in the window looking at this dress. And finally he said, trying on is free. Help yourself. So she said, I asked the sales clerk to come over and to help me, and she got it out of the window for me, and I took it to the fitting room, and I tried it on because that's free, honey. <laughs> that's free. And uh, the husband asked, said, well, in the midst of this temptation, what did the devil have to say? She said, oh, the devil was standing there, and he said, dear, that looks so good on you. That looks wonderful on you. It just, it, it matches your eyes just beautifully. And, and you know, there, there's that, that special occasion that's coming up here in a week and a half where, where your niece is getting married. You could wear that to the wedding. And man, everybody would love it. And it looks so good on you. This is when the husband interrupted and, and said, you know what you should have done? You should have said, devil, get thee behind me. And she said, I did. He said, you did? Then what happened? He got behind me. And a voice from behind me said, wow, it looks good from back here too. <laughs> The devil made me do it. <laughs> so anyways, I'm going to try to talk this morning with the devil didn't make you do it. He didn't make you do it. You have a choice. I'm going to use the scripture from Matthew chapter 4 where we have the temptation of Christ. And I'm going to get to that eventually. But I would like to look at a few things before that. First of all, I would like to look at temptation. What temptation is not what it is not. Do you realize this morning that temptation is not a sin? It is not a sin to be tempted. I am blown away at the people who have researched and looked up and asked questions online, is temptation a sin? Just being tempted, is that a sin? 
and I don't understand it, I don't get it, <laughs> because obviously it's not. But obviously there's a lot of people who think that it is. And so I began to look in Scripture. I went to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. We have a high priest who understands what's going on in our life. We have a high priest who understands our temptations, our tests and trials. So we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize or can't understand our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. So what he's saying, we have a high priest who understands what we're going through because he's been there. You like somebody who's been there, right? If you're going to talk to somebody and get advice from somebody, you want to get advice from somebody that's been there. I've been reading this past week um, Dave Ramsey's book on entre leadership. I've been listening to his podcasts. I've been trying to uh, get myself psyched up to do the budget thing, you know, and man, we got to get something in order here. And I want to listen to somebody who's been there. Here's a young man, was, was a millionaire by the time he was 20, I think, 21, something to that effect, and lost everything and then build it back up. He's been there. He's been rich and he's been poor and now he's rich again. He's been where I am. I want to listen to what he has to say. He interviews millionaires, and he says, we just want to talk. We just want to visit. Why? Because that's where I want to get to. I probably never will, but I would love to someday to get there. So we have a high priest who understands where we are because he was in our position. He was in this place. And yet the rest of that scripture says, yet without sin. Jesus did not sin. In the midst of his temptation, Jesus did not sin. So therefore, temptation is not sin. Amen. (laughs) Thank God. Because we don't have to repent for being tempted. I heard one fellow say, he said, you can't stop the bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from making a nest in your hair. You can do that. All right? So we can't stop temptations. Temptations are going to happen in our lives. But we don't have to act on those temptations. Thank the Lord. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not punishment. Temptation is not a punishment from God. Jesus was in the center of God's will. We see here in, in, in chapter 4, as we'll get to here in just a little bit, Jesus was being led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3, Jesus was being baptized. The crowds was around. He was being baptized. The Father said, this is my Son in whom I well please. The Holy Spirit descended as a dove. That same Holy Spirit is now leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. He is doing what the father wants him to do he's in the middle of god's will if you would say and he's being tempted i think of this this is uh i I like to look at it the uh, disciples were told by jesus it was matthew chapter 14 the disciples are told by jesus to go across the sea and they get in the boat and they start going across the sea and uh you they, they start rowing across the sea and they get about halfway across the sea and the wind picks up and a big storm hits a huge storm hits and they're rowing, and these guys are seasoned um, uh, sailors. They, they know what they're doing. They're fishermen. I mean, they know what they're doing out there, but they can't seem to get to shore. Where were they? In the center of God's will. They were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They weren't being disobedient, and yet they were caught in the midst of a storm. And in your life and in my life, we can be doing exactly what God wants us to do, following in his footsteps in the center of his will and out of nowhere you will be lamb blasted by a temptation you will be hit by an attack of the enemy so temptation is not a punishment temptation will come to you no matter where you are in your walk with god so if temptation is not and and this this is not a uh all-inclusive. I'm not doing an exhaustive study on temptation. I just want to hit, it a, few things, hit a few things this morning. Um, temptation is not a sin. Temptation is not a punishment. What is it then? And there's a quote that I found from a guy named Eric Ross. He said, tempt means test in an unrestricted sense. It is only since the 17th century that the word's connotation has been limited to testing with evil intent. The biblical idea of temptation is not prom- primarily of seduction as in the modern use But in making a trial of a person or putting him to the test, which may be done for the benevolent purpose of proving or improving their quality or the malicious aim of showing up his weakness or trapping him into wrong action. When we think of temptation, what do we think of it? It's evil. It's always evil. It's always negative. It's always bad. It's always horrible. 
But how does God view temptation? What is God's view of temptation? God does not tempt us with evil, as we see in James chapter 1, verse 13. Remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God has tempted me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. So what is God's view of temptation then? And this, again, is not a complete list, but just a few things I would like to look at. God views temptation as a purpose to prove you. God views temptation as a purpose to prove you. Now, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the place to be tempted. He was not tempted by God. God cannot tempt with evil. But he led him to that place to be tempted for a purpose. You are tempted so that you may be proven. Have you come through a temptation with the help of the Holy Spirit? I I find a a lot of times I'll go into a temptation thinking, I got this. (laughs) But just as soon as I get into it, I realize, oh, no, I don't. And I have to cry out for help. And God comes and helps me. And with his strength, I come out the other side. And I look back at that and I say, I never thought I would have been able to make it through that. I never thought I would have been able to, to survive that. But it proved to me that there is one who is within me, who gives me the strength and who gives me the help that I can be more than an overcomer. And, and God, with this temptation, even though I would have never wanted it to happen, but with this temptation, you have proved to me that I can live victorious life. I can live a life victorious. The second reason that I see is to teach. God uses temptations to teach us. Have you ever learned anything from temptation? You go to a place, maybe, uh, I, don't, I don't really know where you're tempted, and you don't know where I'm tempted, so it doesn't matter, but maybe there's a certain area where you frequented it a lot, and it seems like you are tempted in an area that has to do with it. You know what you need to learn? Stay away from that area. <laughs> don't keep going back to that same place. Don't keep hanging out with those same friends. Don't keep doing that. It's to teach you and to train you. If you're going to live a Christian life, if you're going to live a life that is is Christ-honoring, then there's some things that you need to learn not to do. And there's some things that you need to learn to do. And so temptation can be used by God to teach us. Temptation can be used to strengthen you. This goes along with the proving. It kind of goes hand in hand. It proved to us, wow, I made it through that. But when you come through that, then the next one gets a little harder, doesn't it? <laughs> Seems like the next temptation is, is, is stronger. The next uh, desires are stronger and the temptation is harder. But with the help of God, we make it through that. And then we look back at these previous ones and goes, those were nothing. <laughs> this, this ain't nothing to what I'm dealing with now. Why? Because God uses these to strengthen us and to help us in our walk. What's the purpose of temptation to the devil? Obviously to destroy you. That's his purpose. His purpose is to see you fall and to, to get even, if you could say, with God. He would, he would love nothing more than to see a child of God fall into temptation. He loves that. His purpose is to destroy. So when we view temptation from these two different points of view, from God's point of view and from the devil's point of view, can we thank God for temptation? <laughs> I think we can. I believe we can. It's not easy. I'm not, I'm not the first one to raise my hand and ask to be tempted. If God said, okay, who wants to be tempted? I've, I've made this statement a lot of times before. If there's ever a conversation like there was in the book of Job where God and the devil are having a chit-chat, I hope they leave my name out of it, okay? I'm not interested in my name being brought up whatsoever. I will not raise my hand for temptation, and yet when I am in the midst of temptation, can I thank God for it? Absolutely, I can. Absolutely, I can. Because God can use it to make a better person out of me. So we can thank God for temptation. So that was the first look at temptation. The second thing is the eternal tactics. Um, The devil is still the same. You know that? The devil tempted Jesus Christ here in the garden, or here in the the wilderness, and he is using some of the same tactics to get at us. And this is what God has been teaching me over the last several weeks. I shared it a little bit with uh, some of our young people Um, as they were on the bus leaving AYC. I just shared a couple things with them just briefly as they were leaving. But the first thing I'd like to look at is the devil still uses the same tactics that he he used on Jesus. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, and that is pleasure or possessions. Pleasure or possessions. Let's read that scripture, Matthew chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. 
During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. So he was tempting Jesus with a pleasure or a possession. He was hungry. He had a need, didn't he? He had a need. And and Jesus, here, I mean, here's these stones. Turn them into bread. Eat. Satisfy yourself. Satisfy your hunger. Jesus' response to that was, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, this quote was taken from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, and it's referring to a time of wilderness wanderings. Um, the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness, and when after a, a season of them being hungry, they began to complain, but then they realized their dependency upon God, and he provided for them. So the application of this to our lives is, is it wrong to have pleasure? No. Is it wrong to have possessions? No, there's nothing wrong with that. I uh, uh, heard, heard a guy the other day who said that he owed $19,000 on two snowmobiles. And I'm thinking, $19,000 on two snowmobiles? I'd be selling them, Jack. I don't need them. I don't, that's craziness. But if you're in the position that you can have it, there's nothing wrong with having possessions. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. Here's the problem. The children of Israel was complaining to Moses, we're hungry. Come on, get us something to eat. Hurry it up. We got, man, we're we're starving out here. And they quit relying on God. They took their eyes off of God, all right? So here's the application for this. Jesus says here, in the scripture, he says, we must rely on every word that comes out of the word, or every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's what we rely on. Our dependency is upon God. That's where our dependency is on. If you have nice things or if you enjoy pleasures and take your eyes off of God, that's where the temptation is. That's where the sin is. You don't take your eyes off of God and seek of pleasures or in seek of possessions, but you keep your eyes focused on God, keep him first and foremost in your life, and if you have pleasures and possessions, that's perfectly fine. That doesn't matter. But where's your eyes? Are you focused on God? Are you keeping him there? So the first one, was uh, possession or pleasures or possessions. The second one was popularity. Popularity, Matthew chapter four, verses five through seven. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Did you guys know the devil knows scripture? (laughs) He knows scripture. He misquoted it. He misquoted it misapplied it, but he knows it. And he'll quote it to you every time that he gets a chance. Every time he thinks that that you're in a situation where you're tempted to do something, he'll try to find some scripture to match it to help you, to support you. But look at the context. Look at what is being said. Keep your eyes on God. So the the, the, uh, temptation here was popularity. Now, the devil took Jesus to the highest point or the pinnacle of the temple. Um, Some scholars say that it was 450 feet above the temple floor. Some have said it's up to 700 feet. Josephus said that you would get dizzy or giddy up there just looking over the edge. It was was unbelievable, the view from up there. And he took Jesus up there and he said, if you cast yourself down from here, doesn't the scripture say that you'll be taken care of? And imagine this. As Jesus is lowered by angels down to the people that are around the temple, who's going to be worshipped as the Messiah? Who's going to be the popular one? Who's going to be the one that has this great mass, this great following? It's going to be Jesus. Does he tempt you with popularity? He does me. (laughs) He tempts me with popularity. He tells me that, you know what, you're not really that popular. Nobody really knows you. If you would start saying these things, if you would start using this language, if you would start going to these places, then you could get in with the crowd. You could be in with them. It's a temptation we face, right? It's a temptation that each and every one of us probably battle. However, Jesus' response was, the scriptures say you must not test the Lord your God. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, Israel tested or tempted the Lord by doubting. They doubted God. Here they were thirsty. In one place they're hungry, another place they're thirsty. Here they're thirsty, and they were wanting something to drink, and they tested his love for them. They tempted God. We must never be tempted with a desire to accept the acceptance of others or the popularity of a crowd at the cost of offending God. Don't ever look for the popularity around and about you 
if you're not in a right relationship with God. If sin is in this equation, always err on the side of walking with God. I don't care if you like me or not. I'm a child of the king. I'm walking with God. I don't care if you like me. I mean, I want people to like me. I want to be accepted. I want to have friends. But you know what? I would much rather be a child of the king than to, than to sin and, and go that way. So the next one is power. The next temptation that we see Jesus was tempted with was power. Temptation was in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and all their glory. And he said, I will give these to you if you kneel down and worship me. So essentially, what he is saying here, he's saying, Jesus, you came to save the world. I'm giving you a cross bypass. <laughs> We're going to skirt the cross. We're going to bypass the beatings. We're going to bypass the spitting on and all that stuff. We're going to bypass that. And if you just fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this. It's what you came for anyways. You came for the world. So I'll give it to you if you just fall down and worship me. Jesus says this, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus saying, I will worship only the Father. I will keep him in his rightful place. In the same way, each and every one of us, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. If you resist him, he will flee from us. It worked for Jesus. It'll work for us. The next thing I'd like to look at this morning is a standard for defeating Satan. And there may be more ways of this, but this is what I see from, from what Jesus did here. First of all, keep the Father the Father. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> keep him in his place. Keep him as Lord of your life. Keep him as God. Worship his name. Magnify and glorify him. Every response from Jesus was that in my life, I want to glorify the Father. That's what I want to do in my life is glorify him. He says here throughout these, these temptations, really you could take every one of those temptations and it boils down to if, if it's not bringing glory to God, I don't want no part of it. If it's not bringing glory to God, I don't want popularity. I don't want power. I don't want possessions if it's not bringing glory to God. So the first thing is to keep the Father the Father. The second thing, and, and here's what, here's what uh, God's been teaching me for several weeks the second thing is, remember who you are in Christ. The devil wants to tra change your identity. The devil wants to tell you you're something that you're really not. He'll run you down or he'll lift you up in, in man's eyes, either or. He'll come in and he'll tell you that you're a failure. I mean, I know this firsthand. <laughs> the devil has come to me and he's like, 16 years on the mission field, and what do you have to show for it? You're a loser. You're a failure. You did nothing. Your kids, sometimes, sometimes, you know, it's just like, wow, I suck at being a dad. I, just, I can't do this. This is, this is ridiculous. And, and the devil will sit right there on my shoulder and tell me, you're, you're, just, you're just a jerk. Just, just give up. Just stop. You know, we have, a, have an issue in the house, and I stink at being a husband. And, and, and he just sits there and tells me all these things over and over, and I'm just stupid enough to listen to him. And it isn't long until at the end of him just keep telling me all these things over and over and over again. There came a, a point in my life here several years back where I believed him. I believed him wholeheartedly. I believed that this world would be better if I wasn't part of it. If I wasn't here, it'd be a lot better place. Why? Because I chose to listen to what the devil tried to identify me as. I tried to listen to what he told me I am. And not what God told me I am. You want me to tell you what the Bible says that you are? The Bible says that you are a child of God. The Bible says that you belong to God. You've been justified. You are Christ's friend. You are a citizen of heaven. You are chosen. You are chosen before the creation of the world. You are holy and blameless. You are victorious. You are adopted as his child. You are born again. You are a new creation. I am delivered. I am set free. I have been brought near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I have peace. I have access to the Father. I am a member of God's household. I approach the throne of God in freedom and in boldness. I am complete in him who is the head and the principality of power. I am 
am alive in Christ. I am free from the law of sin and death. I am far from oppression. I am born to God and the evil one cannot touch me. I am holy and without blame before him in love. I have the mind of Christ. I have peace that passes all understanding. I have the great one living in me. Greater is he who's in here than him who is tempting me. I have no lack for anything, for God supplies all my needs. I can quench the fiery darts of the enemy. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I am a child of God. I'm a new creation. I'm joint heirs with Christ. I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I am an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. I am a partaker in the divine nature. I am an ambassador of Christ. You want me to go on? I can go on. I can keep going all day. I am somebody in Christ. And the devil will come and he'll attack you and he'll tell you that you're nobody. But I want to tell you something this morning. You are somebody in Christ. Romans chapter 8 kind of just sums this all up. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, For what shall we say about these wonderful things? If God is in my corner, if God is for me, you can't be against me. You can't touch this. Put that hammer down. You can't touch this. If God is in my corner, if God is on my side, you can't have this. You can't touch this. Praise God. I think of David. Man, I just, I love David. David is such an awesome character in Scripture. And I just love how he goes out to fight the giant, Goliath. He goes out there and he looks at that bad boy. And the devil is probably sitting on his shoulder saying, he's big. (laughs) You're little. (laughs) He's seasoned. You're a shepherd. His breast stinks, and you brushed this morning. <laughs> He's ugly, and you're just fair and pale and, you know, have it all together. You ain't nothing to him. But I love what David did. David went out there, and he looked that old boy in the eye, and he says, you come to me. It's almost laughable, Goliath. <laughs> you come to me with your shield. You come to me with your sword and your spear and all. You think you're big and you're bad. I want to tell you something. The last thing I want to be ringing in your ears this morning is that just remember There is a God in Israel. And when you face your giants, when you face your temptations and your tests and your trials, the devil will be sitting right on your shoulder and he'll say, he's got you this time. You're going to trip up this time because you're a failure. You're nothing. You're nobody. He's big. He's bad. He's seasoned. That giant is too much for you. And here's what you can say. This is the last thing that temptation needs to hear right now is there is a God who dwells within. I am none of those things, but I am a child of the King of Kings. You can be a more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. And if you do these things, you come out victorious, you should definitely have a testimony. You should definitely have a testimony. We see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, then Jesus went away, or excuse me, then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of him. Now, the account of the temptation of, of Jesus, we can gain confidence that we can be victorious over the enemy. You can be. Jesus did it, and he's our great example. <laughs> he did it. We can do it too. We can be an overcomer. You face temptations, sometimes you've fallen. Sometimes you've had to get up and dust yourself off. Sometimes you've had to go back and make wrong, wrong paths right. Sometimes you maybe had to go to an individual or, or uh, maybe gather your family around you and say, man, I, I, I messed up. I messed up bad, and I just want you guys to forgive me, and I'm sorry. And with God's help, it's never going to happen again. And then possibly you'll fall again, and you'll say, listen, I'm not giving up on this. With God's help, it's not going to happen again. And you cry out to God. You cry out to him for your strength that you need, and you can be victorious. And when you are victorious, I want to hear about it. (laughs) I want to hear about the victories that God has wrought in your life. I want to hear about, you know what? I was so tempted, and the devil was attacking me so hard, but I looked that temptation square in the face, and with the power of God, and knowing that God is on my side, and that I am a child of the king, I saw that temptation fall. Why? Because greater is he who is in me than him who is in the world. Thank God for that this morning. Praise God. We looked at four different parts this morning. We looked at testimony. We looked at uh, eternal tactics. We looked at standards for defeating the enemy. And we looked at testimony. And if you go through these, each and every one of you are going to face a test. 
You're going to face a test. You're going to face a trial in your life. But I believe from experience and seeing what is here in Scripture, I believe that if you apply what was talked about this morning, you can be victorious. Two things, two things to keep you victorious. Keep the Father the Father. Always magnify, always glorify. Any, any choice that I make, it has to glorify Him. Anything that I do, it has to glorify Him. And the second thing is, don't let the devil tell you who you are. Don't let the devil create your identity. But your identity is found in Christ Jesus. I am his elect. I am forgiven of my sins. I am a child of the king. You can be victorious. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others are experiencing. The temptations that you are facing, somebody right here in this room is probably facing the same exact or like temptation that you're facing. So the temptations in your life are no different from what everybody else is facing. God is faithful. I like how he threw that in there. (laughs) God is faithful. Just want to let you know, God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Does that encourage you? It should. Why? Because God has confidence that I can come through this victorious. God has confidence in me with his help, obviously. But God has confidence in me that I can come through this a victor. That should encourage you. That should uplift you this morning. There's no temptation that has taken you that is different from somebody else. But God is faithful that he's not gonna let you be tempted above that which you can endure. But when you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Now, I wanna tell you something this morning. You might think you're at your breaking point in your temptation. You might think, you know what, God, I, I can't take this temptation anymore. I'm, I'm on the ledge. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready just, just to, to, to give in to this temptation. I'm just, I, I can't take anymore. I need your help. And he pours in more strength, but doesn't show the way of escape. But he'll give you strength. But then there'll come a point in time in that temptation where you'll come out the other end. You've endured it. You'll see that way of escape, that way to get out of it. With the help of God, you'll be able to get out of it and you'll be able to be more than an overcomer. I praise God that we can be victorious through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that this morning. Thank you for your uh, attention this morning. And I I hope that uh, you can take these few words that were said and that it will help you, that it will uh, strengthen you in the midst of your temptation to know that God's on your side. He's in your corner. And look around about you. You've got a lot of brothers and sisters that are praying for you. I got chewed out a couple weeks ago. Andy Andy, uh, uh, ratted me out to my wife that I wasn't sharing very much at men's group. No. Uh, Will calls me the Fort Knox of humans. I don't talk. (laughs) Um, But he he said something about it, and my wife's like, you need to talk more. That's your support group. You need to... (laughs) She kind of preached at me a little bit. I needed it. It's all right. But... uh, um, we have a support group here. We support each other. We care for each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. And you know something I found out and I have a hard time dealing with? If I don't know what you're dealing with, I can't specifically pray for you. And I'm okay when people come to me and say, this is what I'm dealing with. This is my issues. This is my temptation. Will you pray for me? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's hard for me to go to somebody else and say, this is my issue. Because I don't talk. <laughs> I don't like that. I need to be better at that. Andy's going to have to keep me accountable or something in a small group. But uh, um, we need to share with each other. We need to bear one another's burdens and uh, pray for each other. You look around, you've got a bunch of men, and you women have a bunch of women that love you and that care for you and want to see you be victorious.